Welcome back to the Realm of Unpopular Opinions. Today I have an even more simple video than last time, and that is a very fun one, in my opinion. It's things I dislike in my favorite books of all time. I thought this video would be kind of interesting to do, because recently I've just seen this trend of people just either being really positive or really negative about books, and both are kind of annoying, so I want to prove a point, I guess. <laughs> and that is that even in the books I love and that are perfect in my eyes, I can still find flaws or things that I dislike or I think were mishandled or just simply aren't perfect. However, there are a couple ground rules. I will mention an exception where I genuinely cannot tell you something I dislike about it. <laughs> I will also not do petty reasons or like small nitpicky reasons. If I genuinely don't have a huge gripe with a work, I will tell you so. I can't do just oh, I hate this one character, so that's a major flaw, because very often, obviously, characters are meant to be hated, and there's no writing style <laughs> bitching, as I called it in my notes, because writing style is something that is extremely subjective. And since these are obviously all my favorite books of all time, I like something about their writing style, so I'm not going to be talking about that. It's more so going to be story stuff I don't like, story beats I don't like, decisions I didn't like, a route that the story took or something, but obviously since they are on this list, these are works that I deeply, deeply love. So I suppose take this with a bit of a grain of salt. I just really want to prove a point that even on the internet, people don't work in extremes and you're allowed to critique stuff that you love and just straight up irrationally say you hate something, even though there are some upsides to it, maybe. Anyway, <laughs> I'm just making a rant at this point, but this is going to be a shorter video because I just really kind of felt like talking smack about things that I love because I feel like I only talk smack about things that I don't like, and that's, I don't know, not that fun, I suppose. <laughs> the first thing is just going to be an honorable mention. I have here my very tall glass of spirulina, which is just a drink that I very much like, and I drink it every day, but that is besides the point because. I have no complaints about this one, and it is just now to the Valley of the Wind. I have nothing bad to say about this. Like, I wrote up a list of my favorites or things that I particularly want to talk about, and I, I couldn't think of a single thing for this, because at first, I was like, also, by the way, in terms of spoilers, I'm going to try and not do spoilers, but I may talk about themes or certain things twists or you know what I get. I'm not going to talk about this specific story but I'm obviously going to allude to what I didn't like in that specific story. Now <laughs> the thing about Nausicaa is that I was going to say there's a bit too much world building in terms of the fact that there are like many different armies and the first time around especially in like the first bind up volume that I had I did not know who was like on whose side which sides even existed which kingdom existed and was where and what they wanted and believed however I can't call that a bad thing because it just makes rereads a lot more fun like recently I reread I think just the first volume and it was just so fun to be able to explore it further, to see different cultures a bit more clearly now that I know the entire story. So I can't even call that a flaw. <laughs> I, I have nothing to say about this. In my eyes, this is just a perfect piece of fiction. It's just built perfect. The characters are built perfectly. What it wants to say is conveyed perfectly. It's drawn perfectly. There's nothing I can say about this. So this is a bit of an exception because I cannot come up with something that's a flaw <laughs> to this. I don't think I really ordered them in any particular way. I just like look at my shelves usually and just start writing things down as I see them. But Lord of the Rings. <laughs> now, this is very close to Nausicaa that I have no complaints. However, I do have a few minor ones. Like, this is similar to Nausicaa. To me, a master class of world building, obviously. Like, I want to live here. However, there are two gripes. These aren't petty reasons, but there's a, not a typo, but there's an inclusion of a word in the beginning of the book that no one noticed doesn't belong here. Like, just a word that 
can't exist in this world because that thing doesn't exist in that world. So there's that one thing that kind of bothers me. And I can't believe I have to say it because it feels a little bit petty, but I'm going to say why, tell you why it isn't. The Black Marsh chapter, <laughs> chapters, I think it's one chapter, but it could be more than one. That chapter bored me, but I feel like it was supposed to. Like, when I remember my reading experience of that book throughout the last year, and I mean, obviously, the first time that I read it and everything, that is the only section of the book that I feel like dragged. But again, it could be intentional. And in fact, I think it is intentional. Don't come for me like Tolkien fans. I am one and have been one all my life. I think it's intentional. I think that when his writing drags, it's because you're meant to feel that it drags because the characters feel that way. And in the grand scheme of things, like it's a, an 1,100-page book, I think, The Black Marsh is just one chapter or two at best. But that bored me out of my mind. <laughs> I think when I stopped reading last year and then picked it back up later, I think that's where I stopped because I was just so bored reading it. But again, since I've read it so many times, I can skim through that chapter no problem and still get the same effect. So may that's maybe one gripe that I have about the reading process, but there's nothing else I can complain about here. So that's why I kind of put it under Nausicaa. The next thing, and the one that probably has a lot of flaws, even though we all ignore them, is the Wheel of Time. Now, I'm not going to sit here and just list all of them, but I will list a few. Some of them I think we all agree on. Some of them are very personal. However, I won't actually complain about the slog, like many people, because again, since I separate that section of the series into characters and not I don't read the books in order. I read character arcs. I don't experience the slog so severely. However, those chapters where nothing happens for 30 plus pages are the death of my focus <laughs> when I'm reading. Several times, both of the times that I read the books, there's always that one chapter where I feel like nothing is going on except the characters walking around surveying a town or the circus that the circus is like the death of me when i'm reading that or going around camp or just walking around town and explaining the way everything looks i just <laughs> or when he gets into describing architecture i remember the first time that i read it there was this section within the dream world i think it's one of the first instances where they go into the dream world where i struggled i struggled with that chapter again he has good descriptions he has bad descriptions but in a series this long i think the the slog is most felt with these descriptions and with irrelevant scenes that's why everyone calls it the slog even me who doesn't really experience it with the way that i read it just when the chapters get super long and when one of those super long chapters happens to be one that nothing happens in that is just horrendous that is absolutely horrendous especially with particular characters we're not going to name in books like eight nine and ten that that was just atrociously done <laughs> and i feel like if he had ed editors who controlled him a bit better that could have probably been fixed but that is my biggest gripe we're not even going to get into characters because again there's <laughs> like a billion of them some i could complain about for days others i could praise for days, but with most of them, I feel like either reaction is intentional. So we're not going to harp on about that. The next obvious one is The Witcher. Now, <laughs> obviously, obviously, books two and five, I do not even want to discuss. <laughs> so I'm just going to do a rehash very quickly of why this series is so flawed by still my favorite but still my favorite of all time. Book two is unreadable. Books three, four, and five, I will never again, and I say this confidently, I will never again read the series sections. Okay, maybe not book three. I think book three actually has good parts with Siri, but books <laughs> two, four, and five, I never, never again will read the series sections because they bring down the entire series. This is where the nonsense of his writing starts. This is where you can tell he's doing his thing 
where he doesn't care to give you resolution. Like he is just heaping promise upon promise and never wants to give you the payoff. So that is my obviously biggest gripe with this series. The other books, like the three prequels, the first book and books three and four in particular, if you just look at the Geralt sections, excellent, immaculate, wonderful writing and character work. And one of my favorite things of all time. However, we can't ignore, we can't ignore the other stuff. So is this objective or subjective? I don't know, but it is something that I noticed in both of his series that he always, always refuses to do the payoff. So I think you're just better off not expecting the payoff or just avoiding the bit that laughs in your face about expecting the payoff. So <laughs> last time I read it this way, I avoided book two. I didn't even touch it. And I just read Geralt and Company in books three, four, and five. Loved it. Phenomenal. Like I forgot the other bit exists and I was very happy with the series. So the next big one is Earthsea. <laughs> we all know the problems that I have with Ursula K. Le Guin, <laughs> but we will again condense it. I just want to I just wanted to put in one place all the gripes that I had with my favorite books. I'm not I'm repeating myself, but Tehanu <laughs> does not exist. I do not acknowledge the existence of that book. So even if we put that aside, because that would never come to a list of my favorite books. So let's ignore that and just talk about the actual favorite books in the series. I do have a couple gripes. Firstly, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but too short. I think, especially in the first trilogy, all three books kind of read like one book, especially because I have the edition where they're all together, but they are too short individually. I remember when I was going to university last year, I was reading Tombs of Atuan on my phone. I felt like I read it <laughs> extremely quickly. Like that ebook, I think, is very, very short. And I was like, okay, this practically reads like a prologue to a larger book. So I would definitely say that the individual books are far too short. I also disagree about the demographic. People would say they are children's books. Even Ursula would say that, but they do not read <laughs> like children's books. There's a lot of philosophy and intricate world building and cultural stakes and very dark realizations and situations the characters are in that I severely disagree even with Ursula herself that this is children's literature. Now would children enjoy it? Probably. I certainly would have. But is it geared towards children? Like you know what I mean. Like it, this isn't a middle grade Ursula. It's a YA at best. <laughs> Brief side note but I went to wash my hands and I have sandalwood soap and I just lit a sandalwood candle. I feel <laughs> I feel like a grave digger. I don't know why, but that scent genuinely makes me feel like I'm a grave digger or like I live in a church <laughs> for some reason. So even though it's just wood, but off topic, let's just go back to earth. See, aside from book length, I have minor complaints about characters, but those are very personal things. Things that I don't think are just done poorly, but I may dislike them. That said, the first trilogy, which again, I consider just to be one book. Perfect, immaculate. I actually really, really love it. The third installment is my favorite, but other than that, there are two tales and tales that I love and the other wind, obviously, and like the small stuff, the word of unbinding and the daughter of Odren and Firelight and <laughs> small short stories, but I don't have many complaints about Ursula. If you ignore the existence of Tehanu, of several of the tales in the Tales of Earthsea, and if you ignore the fact that the books are extremely short. So I thought I would complain about Ursula for longer, I will say, but if you ignore, again, the existence of an entire book and just look at the ones that I did actually love, I don't have that many complaints. <sighs> the next one... The next one is Winter Night. Now, if you had asked me a few years ago when I read it, if it had any flaws, I would have said no, probably, <laughs> because I, I think I read this last year of high school, I think in 2020, it could have been 2019. I think it might actually be 2019. 
So yes, you, if you would have, have asked me then, I would have said absolutely no flaws, perfect, wonderful. However, I am no longer 18 years old and I have different opinions <laughs> now that I've read a lot more and had different experiences and preferences and whatnot. But I severely dislike the romance plot in this. I will say nothing else nothing else because i think everything else is excellent the world building the representation of slavic mythology the atmosphere writing the magic writing the character work the friendships the relationships the only thing i have a problem with is the relationship i severely dislike it the more i think about it i still think it should have been a mentor mentee relationship which i thought it was for half the series and then was even then mildly disappointed when it turned out to be a romance that really really cheesy scene in book three and the sort of cheesy last line of the book i have gripes <laughs> primarily with the third book now that i think back on it because upon reflection and now that i dislike this romance book one is my favorite <laughs> i used to love books two and three but book one is my favorite there's something about that contained story and the atmosphere of a snowy village and of the forest and of mm, the magic of the frost. And I still love aspects of books two and three, obviously, but since the romance kind of takes the stage later on, I now vastly prefer book one. However, that this still belongs on my favorite books of all time because I just love the characters and the mythology and the magic and the people individually so deeply that it always will be one of my favorites. However, now I have severe issues with the romance. I really should have done this in order on hindsight because Jane Eyre is the next one. I don't know if I have complaints about this one either. I think I should have put it like up top next to Lord of the Rings and Nausicaa. However, I would have complaints specifically just because of Charlotte's writing style, I suppose, which again, I love it. It deeply resonates with me. I love her as a person, as a writer, as, as a character builder. However, she has a bit of a yapper style, <laughs> like because she writes from, is it an omniscient perspective? First person omniscient? I don't know if that exists, honestly, but that type of writing style of dear reader, where you feel like you're being spoken to by the main character as if the entire book is a letter. She has the yapper style. So if there's a part of the book that you don't really like, she is going to go on and on about it. But I would complain about that in the other two books, as we all know from the video that I filmed. I don't know if I would complain about that in Jane Eyre because I feel like, and ironically, this is her shortest book. I feel like she just structured this perfectly. <laughs> like this was her first novel that she did get published it just seems structured perfectly to me like nothing seems too long or too short the relationship is drawn out perfectly this is just the perfect book in my opinion however i thought that i would be bored by her childhood and i thought that i would be bored by her time with sinjin but the only aspect of the book where i'm mildly bored and i feel like it could have been shorter even though i still think it was long enough i just in my brain i feel like when i reread it i skimmed that bit the only that bit of the story and is the bit when she goes back when her into her adopted family when the mother is dying and she meets up with her sisters i do like her new relationship with the sisters so i'm i feel bad critiquing this but i feel like maybe that's the only aspect of the story that i wished was shorter but again this is really nitpicky and i realize i'm breaking my own rule because i disagree with myself i think it's a perfect book i think everything that's in it is necessary and just builds character so i don't know <laughs> i don't know what to say i wouldn't change a single bit of this book but if you were to, were to ask me to complain i guess that would be the bit we've made it to the, to the manga portion of the video now i will be brief here and again, it's not necessarily because I think that no one's interested in manga rather than books. It's because I'm actually more <laughs> interested in some of these manga than some of the books. I'm not making sense. My point is I usually try to be brief with manga because I do primarily talk about books. But 
I don't know. I've been dividing my attention between these two for years, so it is what it is. But <laughs> my gripes about Bunga, I will be very brief. I've said this before. I do not own anything past volume 13, and I do not own the sixth light novel, and I never will own any of those because I... And I will say this quickly. For anyone who is up to date with the manga, who has been reading the chapters monthly, I've been reading chapters monthly for years at this point. Not only does it feel like it, but I am convinced that the author lost track of what he was writing about. I could go into depth. <laughs> I could go into depth, but I'm not going to. But... The point of the story and the themes and the sort of stuff he was highlighting in the beginning are vastly different to what he's writing about now. And I feel like the only medium where he kind of retains what he used to have are the light novels, like the ninth light novel. Again, famously phenomenal. I felt like he wrote something in character again after years of the manga being nonsense. You, you are allowed to disagree. Obviously, if you're a fan of that series, <laughs> good for you. You're going to have a lot more volumes to collect than I do. But, and I say this about every character, but I don't think that, like, the characters are necessarily inconsistent. I think the entire tone, theme, message of the story has shifted dramatically <laughs> from where it was in the beginning. And that's, I think, what happens to a lot of manga that weren't planned initially that don't have a set ending that are just drawn out and eventually the author themselves just loses focus entirely because they have been writing it for so long and they didn't really have a goal in mind so they're just writing 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 and there's no plot thread or narrative theme that they're keeping up with and that's <laughs> my biggest gripe with this series like i think i read the last manga chapter after it came out. I don't even care to read it when it comes out anymore. <laughs> but I just felt like if what happened in the last chapter sticks <laughs> and it like isn't retcon like everything else so far, you know what I'm talking about if you've read it, then I feel like he has just crapped on the entirety of his story. And I, I just am never going to own anything past volume 13. And there's a reason for that. I am. It is the sort of series that I'm able to detach from the rest of it in my mind. Because again, it works based off of arcs. So you can kind of call it quits wherever you want. But I do still kind of keep up with it and read it. Because I want to see what the hell he's going to pull. So... I severely dislike the manga at the moment, actually. And I mentioned this, I think, at one point by last year when seasons four and five were coming out. I loved it. I loved watching it every week. But when it finished, I was so upset. <laughs> just, I hated it so much. And it brought back the memory of how much I hated the manga that I actually just reread everything exactly a year ago because I wanted to remember why I liked the series in the first place. So, yeah, it's pretty bad. Pretty bad. So. We're going to be very brief when talking about Death Note because we all know what the problem is here. I love this story. They actually had a goal in mind. They have built up. They have something they're aiming towards. However, that bit with Mir and Melo did not need to be that long. It did not need to be that long. I don't think in all the times that I've read it and watched it, I've watched it like seven, if not eight times, and I've read it three times at least. I think maybe once or twice I actually watched that bit with Nier and Melo without skipping or straight up just scrolling through it or flipping through the pages. It did not need to be that long. I have the all-in-one <laughs> manga edition and it has 2,400 pages. I think at least, if not more, a thousand of those are that section of the story and it did not need to be that long. I think we can all agree it did not need to be that long. Like, we had like a pace set with the first half of the story and I feel like it just halts, <laughs> grinds to a halt in the second half. So while I still love the ending and I knew what it was going to culminate in, I did not like how we got there in the second half. <laughs> the next two I might like combine because I don't have a lot to say, but as far as Natsume goes, I really struggled to think of something, but I do have one gripe with it. I talk about it as if it's the best thing ever written, and 
it almost is in my eyes for its genre it's perfect however i do have one gripe and that is because it toes the line between goofy and serious and it does it well it sometimes sort of leaves you hanging there's a an arc in particular that's i think going to be now in season seven in the fall which i can't wait for but there's an arc that genuinely feels a little bit more serious than usual and a little bit more dramatic and high stake than usual and you almost expect it to not be as comforting and calming as usual but then when it is you're almost disappointed <laughs> like i'm going to use almost a lot when talking about it because i'm never disappointed with it but there were one or two instances in the story where i was like okay this could technically go the other way like this could be an arc that isn't that simple and is actually a little bit more on the bleak side instead of on the comforting side so i'm mildly mildly at best disappointed that we just didn't go that way not that i ever want the series to be bleak it's actually bleak enough <laughs> in terms of the main character's experience with life but several times i just felt like okay this arc felt like it could be a bit more serious but it just wasn't in the end because that's just not what the author wants to do and that's fine i love that but several times i just felt like you know i got to a high and then just dropped because she refuses to write it that way and another very minor complaint that i have is that she doesn't reveal stuff often like <laughs> there's actually so much we still don't know about his grandmother and the thing that interests me most is how and in what capacity Madara knew his grandmother and how he was trapped. I don't know if she will ever reveal that or she, if she's just going to keep doing snippets like she has been doing the entire series. But I feel like she's sort of withholding information in a series that doesn't really need that information withheld like you don't need to sit me down and tell me all the information but it's been 30 volumes it's been 30 volumes and seven seasons and a film i feel like i want to know more about reiko and i want natsume to actually just sit down with madara and be like how do you know my grandmother in what way did you meet her how were you trapped and that kind of stuff so maybe reveal it uh, soon because i am actually curious and the teasing teasy little bits are just <laughs> a little bit jarring after some time the last bit of the video i think is just going to be a complaint that's not necessarily directed at the authors <laughs> themselves because it's not their fault but more so the fault of the entire industry over there in japan you hilariously overwork your authors or just the culture itself makes the authors overwork themselves because they feel that they have to to i don't know retain some sort of audience or whatever but <clears throat> i'm going to kind of lump these in together but first of all tokyo ghoul suffers from this as much as the next thing that i'm going to focus on noragami why noragami actually isn't on my favorites of all time is because of the ending <laughs> it's because of the ending i in no way disliked the ending but and this fits in for both of the authors they were ill when they were finishing it i think it's similar with the author of demon slayer i think a lot of authors never finish it or finish it very quickly and a little sloppily because they are ill which again i don't blame them i blame sort of the culture that forces them to do this instead of just taking a break and coming back when they're capable of providing what they actually wanted to provide but the ending of noragami <laughs> i i've never talked about this on here before kind of left me feeling a little bit betrayed because these authors are excellent at build up and payoff like i feel like if some people disagree that they drew out the bit with the father a little bit i disagree actually i think it was very perfect perfectly ended but the ending itself with the main characters was what actually disappointed me severely because throughout the series we know certain things about these characters and their circumstances and i was wondering how they were going to handle them like how certain situations would work how would characters handle relationships that they couldn't really keep up now that this crisis is over and they're going to grow up and different worlds and all of that there are several instances where i was like there's no way they can wrap that up i want to see how they're going to do it and the authors because they were ill and just wanted to finish it 
didn't didn't answer any of those questions <laughs> like they didn't answer any of those questions the ending i feel like was the only way they could have ended it to leave you satisfied without answering any of those questions but i still disliked it i still really disliked it because it felt like a cheap way out and i need to repeat one more time that i don't blame them for being ill i blame them for pumping out an ending it's essentially like you can you can have this i we can't make an ending right now that answers the question so just have this and leave us alone and i hope they're better and i hope they heal and good for them i hope they feel better and all but i don't feel better like as a consumer of your story i don't feel better i feel like it was building up towards a very complex situation with the main characters and i wondered how you were going to handle that <laughs> Like, at, throughout 27 volumes, I wondered how you were going to handle this dynamic, and you didn't handle it or address the problems with it at all. This is hard to talk about without spoilers, actually, so let's just do it like this. <laughs> I'm going to briefly talk spoilers. You can just skip to the next se section of the video, which is the outro. Okay, spoilers from now on. The complex situation of Yato and Hiri as characters was fascinating to me because she's human and he's a god. Even if they did somehow have a relationship, which it was building up towards that the entire story, they can't be together. Literally in no way can they be together because she is going to grow old and he's always going to look 20. It's the classic mortal immortal situation. So let's say they're not together and she dies can either pick her up to be his shinky, in which case she won't remember their lives together and what they went through, or he can just let her move on. I feel like there was no scenario in which they could be together past her high school experience. And I was really interested in seeing how Adachidoka were going to address this. Like, why are you building up a romance that essentially can't really happen? And the way they did it in the end was just that they didn't speak for like, almost a decade probably because i think she was a freshman in high school throughout the entirety of the manga and then in the ending she's already a doctor or an intern or whatever it's called so maybe like 10 years have passed and they see each other and they smile at each other and she remembers him and i'm like what kind of an ending is that they haven't seen each other for 10 years but she remembers him and that's actually a sad ending because i feel like it would have been a good ending if he's just watching over her and nothing happens and she can't see him anymore because this is just sad 10 years on she actually remembers him and there's nothing that can happen with that i think it was a cool opportunity to explore the fact that they cared for each other but genuinely nothing <laughs> nothing could become of it it would have been also unique i think if she became his shinky in the end or something or it was implied that when she died he got her but she was also like like the two exceptions that she can remember her life because it wasn't a sad life or a tragic life and then she remembers it and they're kind of together forever if that makes any sense but i'm also not sure i don't remember canon right now if characters that didn't suffer even lingered as shinky <laughs> i think all of them suffered maybe the normal people just pass on but you could argue that like i don't know she had unresolved business because she was in love with a god so she does remain as a shinky and he takes her to be his weapon like he kind of does in the ending but it's never explored the ending just feel felt very lackluster i feel like i'm just <laughs> ranting about it at this point but it needed saying and it just felt like none of these actually complex situations were addressed at all they just see each other after 10 years and we're meant to be happy and just not think about what's supposed to happen next, even though we know that nothing can actually happen next because she's no longer in high school. She has an actual job and she's an adult and she can't just go frolicking with him anymore. So it just felt sad in a way because I realized that the authors weren't going to address <laughs> all this stuff that they left unresolved, which again, not their fault, but I'm just the end consumer. So rant over. <laughs> My throat really hurts when I talk this much. You would think that I'm not a yapper, but I am in specific company. Actually, it's just been a while, I suppose, since I yapped and yapped and yapped. So my throat kind of hurts and it's really hot and I have allergies. Anyway, and that's it for the video. <laughs> 
you can skip around i'm going to obviously make chapters because i find that really important as a viewer too except in vlogs i usually try to make chapters for my videos because i feel like you can just very easily skip stuff without having to navigate it very chaotically so in order to let my voice rest, I'm going to leave now and let me know if you agree with some of this, if you disagree with some of these, or more importantly, if you found major flaws with the books that you love, because I think it's really important to just acknowledge that, especially as writers too, if someone else is a writer, that fiction is never perfect. That's the point of it. It isn't real. And because it all comes from your head instead of from reality, it's going to have flaws. And there's going to be mistakes and plot holes and it's just not going to be perfect. And that's excellent, actually, because it's kind of a confidence booster. So I will see you in the next video.